Thank you, praise team, for that. That was wonderful. Thank you for leading us in worship. And good morning once again. And uh, good morning to you who are watching online. It may not be morning when you watch online, but thank you for tuning in and joining us here at Willow Hills Baptist Church. If there's anything we could pray with you about, walk on this journey of faith with you through, please um, don't hesitate to call, send us an email, reach out to us. We want to join you on this journey of faith as well. So we're going to continue in this series in the Gospel of Matthew. Last week, as we talked about, Jesus calmed a storm and we navigated through walking, uh, navigating the waters and walking through the storms of life. God sometimes stops the storm, he calms the storm, and other times he walks with us through the storm. And with this, though, we talked about really the external storms, which are inevitable. They come up. External storms come up. Life transitions, we talked about, health issues, uh, financial storms, relationship storms, whatever they are, they're inevitable. But now we're going to move on to the storm that rages within. Storm isn't always external. There's a storm raging within us. There's an inward battle. We wrestle in the soul. Where the heart is troubled. And then there's struggles. And many times only you know it. Others don't see it, but God knows it. And so we end the Gospel of Matthew. I want to start by asking this question. Why was Jesus in the boat? Why was he out to sea that day? Again, this is going to continue to be significant for us, and we addressed this last week, but that, let's come together again and understand this. In Matthew 8, 18, Jesus gave an order to get in the boat, and we're going to the other side. That's authoritative, a direction, an order. We're going to the other side. So there's the answer to that. Jesus is here in Capernaum, and that's this picture of the Sea of Galilee here, and I'm doing this backwards, so I think I got it right. He's on the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee, and they're going to get on the boat and go sort of southeast to the other side, to Gadara, also known as the Gerasenes, get into more Gentile territory because Jesus said this is where we're going. Follow-up question. Why did he want to go to the other side? Now, as we read through the scripture and we understand the story, a simple answer that is partly true, partly true, is that Jesus wanted to get his disciples away from the crowd. They were asking questions, they were trying to make him king, and all these things. He's like, let's, let's, whoa, let's back up, let's regroup, let's get away from this. And again, that's partly true. But I believe there's a deeper, more spiritual answer to this question. When we're in a storm, whether it's external or internal, we're challenged to cry out to God, to cling to God. And again, this crying out to God, this clinging to God, this understanding in the Hebrew mind and the way it's put in the Hebrew context, especially in the Psalms, means to make a big noise. You're loud. You're in God's presence. God, I want you to hear me. God, I need you to hear me. It's about being persistent and consistent. I made this statement. I want us to understand this. God hears the cry of desperate people who turn to him. God hears the cry of desperate people who turn to him. The Exodus, a great example of that. The people of God are, are in bondage in Egypt. They're suffering and they're hurting. And, and God goes to Moses and said, I've heard the cry of my people. And I have come down to rescue them. I have heard the cry of my people. I've come down to rescue them. One of my favorite stories in the Bible, and all of them are my favorite stories, but one I really 
I'm attuned to is blind Bartimaeus in Mark 9. Blind Bartimaeus is a beggar on the side of the road. He, he, he's just there, and, and it's like, who sent him or his parents that he's there? And here comes Jesus with his entourage. He's got his disciples asking questions, and, and they're talking, people coming up with needs, and, and whatever it is, there's a big crowd with Jesus, and they're going down the road, and there's lots of noise, and there's lots of people talking, and, and I don't know about you, but I have a hard time hearing with background noise. And he's crying out, Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. And they're telling him to be quiet. Jesus ain't got time for you. And you know who Jesus hears? This blind man. Because God hears the cry of desperate people who turn to him. Story is similar to Jesus going through Samaria. He wants to deliver the word, yes, and the kingdom, the news of the kingdom to the Samaritans as well. But the King James Version says, I must needs go through Samaria. Now, that's kind of a weird way to say it, right? I mean, I must needs go through Samaria. He's talking about the importance. Again, I have to do this. I must go there. Yes, to deliver the news of the kingdom to the Samaritans. But also, I just wonder, and perhaps he hears the cry of a desperate woman at a well and is going to meet her. He has the understanding of being a spiritual beggar. As Jesus would teach on the Sermon on the Mount, the poor in spirit, spiritually begging, I have nothing, I am nothing, I have nothing to offer, I need, please. God hears the cry of desperate people who turn to him. And so the understanding as I see it, the answer to the question, why did he need to go to the other side? I believe he needed to meet two men who are being tormented within. Who Satan was attacking and breaking down and destroying. Not with an external storm, but something within. God looks at the heart and hears the cry of desperate people who turn to him. So let's pick up this story. As they get through this external storm, it's over. And the goal was to arrive on the other side. And they arrive on the other side. So let's pick that up. Read again in Matthew 8, beginning in 28. Matthew 8, 28. And when he came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him coming out of the tomb so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a herd of many pigs were feeding at some distance from them. And the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, send us away into the herds of pigs. And he said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the water. The herdsmen fled, and going into the city, they told everything, especially what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. Uh, Jesus, please leave. We don't want none of this. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this, your word. Holy Spirit, have your way as you teach all of us, including myself. We gather here not to hear from me, but to hear from you. So God, speak so we may hear and apply it to our lives and live for you. Based in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. Now again, we have just this story here from Matthew, and Matthew is a straight shooter. He just tells the story, gets to the point, it's over. So if you're looking for a long, drawn-out story, you're typically not going to get that from Matthew. He's going to say, here's what happened. Okay, next story. Here's what happened. If you want more of the details, you can get into Luke and to Mark as they share those gospel accounts. 
Again, Matthew's about the facts. We get some more details and the bigger picture from Mark and Luke. What we have here is this a man so fierce, living out in the tombs, that that's death. No one wants to live there, and no one's going to go there. So you, we're just going to send him off. You go live over there. You're crazy, man. Get away from us. We get a little bit more detail as we look at the Gospel of Mark. So we're going to look at that and just take a look at it. It's Mark 5, 1 to 6. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. Again, don't get caught up. It's the Gerasenes, it's the Gerasenes. It's the same region, depending on how you looked at it from a Jewish perspective or from a Roman perspective. Both of those communities were in the same region. So he goes over to the other side of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Mark identifies one man, two men. He's, he's picking up on this one man and telling the story about this one man. He lived among the tombs, again in death, away from life. No one could bind him anymore because, because he couldn't be bound. He was just so in anguish. Not even with chains, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart. He broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day above the tombs and on the mountains, he was always, what was he doing? Crying out. He was always crying out. And he was cutting himself with stones. The understanding here is, and what scholars believe is, he's trying to stone himself to death. And therefore, he's not dying, and so he's leaving cut marks on him from trying to stone himself to death. And when he saw Jesus afar, he ran and fell down before him. See, what do we do when the storm rages within? When it's in here? How do we handle it when it's not an external storm? This is there's many, many external storms. There's different variations of the internal storm. It's some things that we internalize and keep inside of us and bottle up and hold in. Grief. Loss of a loved one. Maybe it's a prodigal son or daughter not doing the right thing. You have faith, but still you have to deal with it, and there's reminders of it every day, isn't there? You think about it. You think about him. You think about her. That's just grief. Fear. Nation seems to be falling apart. What's going on? Fear of the unknown. That's usually what fear is, right? We, we, we don't know what's going to happen. And so we have this fear. Things we don't see coming. I don't know what's going to happen, what's out there. The what ifs. The Bible talks about fear not. 365, fear not. But the reality is, Fear is real. What could happen? Worry. Inflation. Prices are skyrocketing. Gas, really? And they're saying the prices of gas are coming down. Thank you for the nickels and dimes. Do I retire or do I not? We worry about our kids, whether they're in the home, whether they're growing up or out. Are they okay? Are they walking with the Lord? Are they safe? Are they doing the right thing? Our grandchildren, they're growing up in this environment. They have to live in this world. It can consume us. Unforgiveness. Even of yourself. You ever make a dumb decision? Uh, yeah. My, you're going to leave me hanging? Okay. <laughs> Yeah? Why did I do that? That was stupid. You got this beef with someone. They did you wrong. And the Bible says you need to forgive them. Oh, yeah, really? Pray for them. What? Are you serious? I know I need to do this, but it's easier said than done, isn't it? 
So we internalize it. Insecurity. You don't make as much money as your friends. Maybe you want to give things to your family and you just can't do it. Some people place their identity in positions and what they do and what they have in their reputation. How about anger? Frustration. Why am I angry? Are, are, are you blaming yourself for decisions you've made in your life? That there is a righteous anger. Is this a righteous anger? Is this a sinful anger? Because I'm just angry and we bottle it up because we don't know what to do with it because also the Bible says that a fool vents his anger but a wise person holds it back. So I'm going to be wise and hold it back but you know what? It stays here. What do I do with it? We have decisions to make that are, have life-altering consequences. The storm rages within whatever it is. And the enemy wants to torment you. He likes it. Because he can't break you up and beat you down with an external storm. He's going to come inside and do it. Yes, be angry. Yes, worry. Yes, have fear. Yes, hold on to that grief. He likes it. King James Version uses a word called vexation, to be vexed. And I like that word. It has a negative connotation, but it's so fitting. It has the understanding of being gnawed at, rubbed, irritated, consumed, attacked, painful, annoyed. You ever get something in your eye? And it's irritating. Try to get it out. Can't get it out. That's what it means by being vexed. There's this inner turmoil and stress and anxiety. We can so easily become like the madman of Gadara. So easily become like that. Frustrated, angry. We bottle it up. It hurts our health. It affects our quality of life. We even take it out on others, and so others don't want to be around us, and, and so we end up isolated from other people like those madmen. See, the world, our communities, our culture, they see this and they try to address it. They bind people up. They push the problems away. I have even heard this. So somebody who's just in pain and grief and this in, internal storm, you know what? You, you just need a vacation. Right? Uh, oh, that's going to fix everything. Don't spend more money on vacation and come back to the same stuff, right? Go to therapy. Talk to somebody about it. Sometimes they're put in the psych wards. Here's medication. What you need is to take this medication and everything will be much better for you. Now let me say this. There's a place for counseling. We counsel. We talk with people. We'd love to talk with you if you're going through hard times and difficult times. There's a place for medication. I get that. So I'm not anti-medicine. But what I'm saying is this. We need to get to the root cause of the problem. That's symptoms. There's a diagnostic tool that back in the day, it's been renewed in a different name now, but dsm 4 and you can look through there and find whatever disorder you want. A big book of disorders. And you know what? I even Googled it to see how many disorders there were, mental disorders there were. And I don't know if Google's right or not. You know, you usually get good information from Google. Right? Yeah, you, okay. But they said there's 450 different mental disorders. 450. I think that's low. You know why? Because we label everything a disorder, don't we? That's what we're going to do. We're going to label it a disorder, deal with it as a disorder, treat it as a disorder. But when we do that, we're treating the symptom, not the problem. We need to get to the heart of the issue. Stop treating the symptom and get to the root cause of the problem. Obesity is a big issue today. Childhood obesity. You see it on the news. You read about it. They're having you know, these commercials about childhood obesity. What is the root cause of that? Yeah, junk food. But you know what else? Kids aren't as active as they used to be. You know what happened in the summertime in my home? 
I got up in the morning, I left, and I was gone. My parents weren't worried about me. They knew I'd eventually come home. When the street lights turned on, you know what I'm talking about? I was out at the swim club, and yes, I was on the swim team. I was also on the dive team. Think about that one. Uh-huh. That was fun. I played ball. I was into sports. We played kill a man in the neighbor's backyard. Somebody would eventually feed me, one of the parents. Sometimes it was my parents. And when that street light came on, I better get home. You see, now this TV, video games, electronics, nobody wants to go outside. Let's get to the root cause of the problem. Fear, anxiety, grief, whatever it is, instead of addressing the symptoms, let's get to the root cause of the problem. And what is the root cause of the storm within? Powers are at work buying for your life and soul. Powers are at work buying for your life and soul. There's a spiritual battle going on, a battle for your soul and for your very life. You have on one hand Satan who's coming to steal, kill, and destroy. You have Jesus who says, I came to give you life and life abundantly. And there's a big clash. And it's being fought within you. Come back to the men of Gadara. See, today we label it a disorder. When in reality, they're being vexed, tormented, attacked, broken apart on the inside. And the community, and even this man, they're trying to fix it. Bind him up, put him in chains, cast him away, get him out of here. Instead of dealing with the real problem. But he does something right, doesn't he? He cries out. He cries out to God. Now, as we come back to this story, notice this, the presence of Jesus. Let's again think about this story. Jesus gets in the boat. I got to go to the other side. Storm comes up. Now, they're on the other side. What does Jesus do? Jesus enters the picture. Simply the presence of Jesus made all the difference. All he did was show up. So let's look at this. And when he came to the other side, come to the Gadarenes, here comes these demons. They cry out, what do, I do, do with, uh, what do you have to do with us, son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? We know there's a judgment time. We, we, we know what's coming up. It's not now. And if you're going to cast us away, put us into these pigs. So the scene is this. Jesus simply gets off the boat. He comes on shore. And these demons recognize him. Here they are. And here they are. They're the ones who now are vexed. There's a storm raging within these demons. They're freaking out. They're hysterical. Oh, we know who you are. Oh, my, oh my goodness, are you coming here to, to take care of us before the appointed time? Oh, don't do that. Cast us in these pigs. They're, they're, they're the ones that are in turmoil and stress now. And Jesus says one word. He gets off the boat, comes to the next, freaking out, coming to turn into hysterical. Go. Go. Wow. The power of Jesus. The authority of Jesus. Matthew is painting a picture, starting to show us who Jesus really is. He has authority over disease. He has power and control of the seas and the winds, and he is superior to the demons. He has power. What do we do? We cry out to God. We, we cling to God and say, we need your presence, Jesus. We need you to come into our lives. And as we cry out, the first thing we say is this, Jesus, take control. And again, that's much easier said than done, isn't it? Jesus, take control. His power is superior to the power of the enemy. Are we resting in God? Are we turning to God? You know, I know the difference in my life when I'm trying to hold on to things and take control of it myself. I stress out. I get anxious. I mess it up. We need to surrender and submit to God. When a person 
and it's hysterical and they're freaking out. You can't talk to them, can you? And you know what typically people say to them? Get yourself under control. You say that to the kids, right? They're, they're, they're hysterical. They're, they're, get yourself under control. Really? Jesus, take control. Because I'm hysterical right now. I'm in, I'm in the storm. Jesus, I need you to control. Holy Spirit, come. I need your help. He's more powerful. Remember this phrase? You can do more than pray after you have prayed. There's a whole lot of things you can do. Give God control. You can do more than pray after you have prayed. You cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. Kids are little and we're out at night. Nathan always wanted to hold my hand. I still even hold his hand. It's embarrassing for him now. He's 12. You know, like, <laughs> Come here, little buddy. It's not the same. But as we were walking and people would be around, he just had this death grip on my arm and my hand. And I'd be like, it's okay, little buddy. Dad's here. Calm down. The storm in the night, and we talk about thunderstorms. I love thunderstorms. Here it comes at night, and the kids are real, real little. Here comes one, and then all, well, all four of them start coming. Why? It was the comfort of mom and dad. Protection, power, strength. God says, come to me. I want to comfort you and hold you tight to me. Did you ever hold your kids? And, and they come into you and they're afraid, they're upset, they're hurt. And, and they come in and all of a sudden then they kind of peek out. Because they know there's strength and power there. Do, do you believe God is in control? Do you? You really do believe God is in control? Do you practice that? Do you live that? Placing things into God's hands. Had a discussion with my youngest daughter, 15. 15. Going to be 16 soon here in, in August. And she feels a call to some sort of mission work. Medical mission work. Doing mission work. And I said, let's pray through that. Let's explore that. And she says, Dad, there's the mission team that's going to Costa Rica. And we'll go on that trip. Great way to explore that. This is a sense of calling. Before we make a commitment saying this is it. It became real when I brought her up here at 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> yeah, to put her on the bus to go to the airport to fly to Costa Rica. Yes, Doug Goldsmith said I'll keep an eye on her, and I know he did, and he has. But I'm placing her in God's hands. I know there's parents in here with the same thing. And their children go off and do mission work. My oldest son is not walking with the Lord. He wants to go out and do his thing. Your ways are not my ways. So we commit him in the hands of the Lord. Out in Utah, living, we hear from him. And all we could do is pray, God, bring believers into his life. God, bring believers into his life. And God did. His boss is a believer and he goes to church with him. God is in control. Do you practice that and do you believe it and do you leave it there? Jesus needs your permission to exercise the powers over the storm in your life. Jesus needs your permission to exercise power over the storms in your life, whether they're inside or out. He will not force himself on you. You need to surrender and submit to the Lord first. You know, I know people who say, I just can't let go. I can't give it up. You know what you need to do? Just allow God to take it. Say enough is enough. He can exercise authority over it. Then he can help you deal with it. He must set you free first. See, then we come to the point, Jesus, teach me. Only then can he be taught. Because see, again, if, if people are hysterical, they need to be under control first before they're taught. In, G, in Mark's version, it he goes on to say that the man was sitting at the feet of Jesus in his right mind when the community came out to see what was going on. See, after Jesus took spiritual control, now Jesus teach me. Now, now Jesus show me how to deal with this grief, this worry, this insecurity. Now we can understand that we grieve as a people who have hope, the hope of eternal life. Jesus comforts. 
Jesus heals. And he even uses our hurts and our pains. Let's never forget that. How do we deal with this worry of fretting one day at a time? Jesus says, daily bread. Let's calm down, pause, come to him. What do I do now? Insecurities. Jesus says, come to me, be found in me. I give strength, I give wisdom. I can do great things in and through you if you would let me. It comes down to peace. Receive the peace of Christ. Peace. Jesus makes a statement in John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. No, no. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. See, he's contrasting with the peace of the world with his peace. There's a difference. The world gives peace in a different way because they try to address the symptoms. Jesus says, take my peace. It's totally different. How is it different? Because he's talking about shalom. That's the word for peace in Hebrew. That word has the understanding of freedom. You could even say salvation. So when Jews would come and meet each other, they'd say, shalom, brother. What they're saying is, be free today. Be set free in your soul. So he can begin to teach us. And then we say this. Jesus, use me. Jesus, take control. Jesus, teach me. Jesus, use me. You see, at the end of this, the story, all it says in Matthew's version, again, he just gives the straight shot, right? He gets, gets right to the point. They came and said, uh, okay, Jesus, uh, can you leave? Get out of here. We don't want you here. And that's how that story ends in Matthew. But again, Mark adds a little bit more detail. It's not going to be on your screen, but if you want to join me in this reading, I'm going to read it for us. It's Mark 5, beginning in 17. Mark 5, 17. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from the region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. Can I go with you, Jesus? And it says he did not permit him. No, you can't come with me. And Jesus said to him, go home to your friends. Tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And when he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis, that's the whole region, how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. See, it's about your testimony, the change in you. What has Jesus done in your life? Have you given him control, and he's made a change in you, and given you peace? Has he taught you how to live through the various circumstances of life? He has, now he wants to use you. Jesus wasn't welcome there. They saw this power and they didn't want it around. And they said, please get out. And notice he agreed and he left. Jesus isn't going to be somewhere where he's not wanted. He's not. The man who wanted to go, but Jesus says, no, you stay and be a witness. You proclaim the goodness of God. You spread the gospel. I had a teacher in high school called American Government history, Mr. McBride. Great guy. Average size guy. I'm not going to go into sizes and weights and all that because I'm not good at that. Just an average size guy. Thinning hair, quiet demeanor. I don't think he ever raised his voice. Good man. He went to the college that I would end up at and was recruited to go to to play football. And he played ball there too. And he comes up and says, I know they're recruiting you. Just go on a recruiting visit. You might like the school. And I ended up there, Ashland University in Ohio. And so I go for the recruiting visit. If you know anything about recruiting visits with this for sports, they take you around the stadium and you see the locker room and they let you try on the jerseys and all that stuff. You know, it's fun. It's really neat. And then they take you to the Hall of Fame. Your name could be up here too on these walls. So I'm looking at these bronze plaques. 
And there's one right in the middle. It, and honestly, it felt like this. I mean, this is over 30 years ago. But it was almost like a light shining on one. And I was like, oh, here it is. It said, uh, Dan McBride. Although it didn't say that. It said, Dan, Mad Dog, McBride. What in the world? Mr. McBride, Mad Dog? I said, does that bus kind of look like him? Yeah, I mean, it's a, lot, a long time ago, but I, what in the world is this? Dan, Mad Dog, McBride. Now, now look at him closer. I'm reading it. He was an All-American tight end his sophomore, junior, and senior year. Oh, it gets better. He was an All-American defensive end, junior and senior year. The man played both ways in football. What in the world? Dan, Mad Dog McBride? And I, so, so I'm asking questions like, oh, yeah, the, the stories and legends about, well, Dan, I, the coaches were saying, yeah, I know he's a teacher at your school and all that. And they said it, he used to come out on the field and go up to the line, and he, he would grunt. Uh, uh, uh. It sounded like a dog growling. Oh, uh, Mr. McBride? No. So I go back to school that next week and sitting in his class and I was an angel. I wasn't going to release the mad dog, you know. I was, you ever seen Leave it to Beaver? Eddie Haskell? I wasn't cutting up in his class again. Good morning, Mr. McBride. I talked to him after class. I said, uh, Mr. McBride, you know, this is the school I'm going to go to. This is the right fit. I think it's a good place for me. He agreed. And I said, I've got one question. Mad dog? He's like, what did you say? I'm like, oh, no. Oh, no. I said, Mad dog? He said, oh, okay, Andy, that was a long time ago. That was a long time ago. I, I said, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. McBride. You don't get the name and the title, Mad Dog, and say that was a long time ago. And he said, you know, that was a long time ago. That was a great time playing sports and having fun in college. I teach now, and I enjoy pouring into you guys. That was a long time ago. See, in Gadara, there's at least one man walking around. And they're going to point out to him and say, uh, aren't you the madman that used to be down in the tombs, cutting yourself, hitting yourself with stones? That was a long time ago. That was a long time ago because, see, I met a man named Jesus. That was a long time ago. We live in a world, a nation, communities, where Jesus is not wanted. He's asked to leave, rather kicked out. He's not wanted in the schools. He's not wanted in politics. He's not wanted in the courtroom. He's not wanted on the sports field. A coach can't even kneel and pray after a game. He's not wanted in many social media platforms. Jesus may not be welcome, but you are here. You are here. Worship team, you can come back up and start getting into place. You can be and should be a witness. You stay and proclaim the goodness of God. You spread the gospel in word and deed. You be a living example of the power of God to transform a life. It begins when you allow Jesus to take control. Is there a storm raging within you? Are you struggling with grief and security? Any of these things are something that I didn't even mention is there something going on with, inside of you? Allow Jesus to take control. Surrender and submit it to him. And then allow him to teach you and walk with you through that storm. And then say, Jesus, use me. Here's the biggest part of it for us who are believers. We know people. And if we don't know people who are going through a storm, there are people out there who are going through a storm. Ask for God to open up your eyes to see that. Go find someone who's in a storm and allow Jesus to work through you to set them free as he did you. If you don't see them, ask God to reveal them to you. God, take control of what's going on in my life. And then teach me. And then God, use me. So if you're going through a storm this morning, we want to walk with you through that storm. Pastor Whitney and I will be in the back. We want to pray with you. Go and pray with us. Don't leave this place. Don't, don't hold on to it yourself and deal with it inwardly. It'll destroy you. Allow Jesus to take control. Allow Jesus to teach you. And if you are set free, go and pray with someone. Talk to someone. If it's not me and Pastor Whitney, pull somebody else aside. We'll join you in the journey of faith. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this, your word.
Thank you, God, that you are in control of all things. God, we surrender, submit to you this morning. God, do your work within us, we pray. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen.